the Pediatric Lounge, a podcast taking you behind the door of the Physician's Lounge to get a deeper insight into just what docs are talking about today. From the clinically profound to the wonderfully routine and everything in between. Good afternoon, George. It's Tuesday morning and I'm in Manassas, Virginia, covering the office of a great friend of us and a PG United uh, fellow member, Brian. And yes. we have a great um, host, uh, guest today, Dr. M- uh, Michael Martin, who's a dear friend of us. Okay, and his topic today is going to be the different looks of independent pediatric practice and advocacy at the AAP level. And I want to correct you, it's the afternoon. It's the afternoon. <laughs> uh, welcome, Mike. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me, guys. This is fun. I, I enjoy oh. doing these. It's, it's a pleasure. Uh, so, Mike, why did you become a pediatrician? Oh, geez. In, in one minute or less? In one know? minute or less. <laughs> um, for me, it's, it's a unique juxtaposition of, of things. Um, I've always done stuff with kids, which I think every pediatrician said, right? I, I coached. I, I just I loved working with kids. And it really appeased, it appealed to my analytic side, too, and, and the love of science. And, you know, I, I played around in college with doing research and, and going that path and just realized um, I'm a people person. Um, I don't I need I need uh, to be up and moving and doing different things and having uh, a job that I'm not sitting at a desk and I constantly constantly changes and, and provides different opportunities. And so Peds, Peds was it it's yeah. very early on. Now, you started your career in Northern Virginia with Dr. Schwartz, who's uh, left us, right? I did. And you were there for 10 years. What, what was it like to work with Dr. Schwartz? Yeah, it was, you know, even right from the get-go, it was an interesting experience um, when I was even applying for the position. Um, and I, the common theme you'll see with me is I don't like the subtle doing one thing. I like, I think you'll see that with a lot of entrepreneurs and practice owners, um, we need to have different things to dabble in. And there's no one that exemplified that more than Dr. Schwartz. Um, and I remember meeting him. I, 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 I was at a long, long uh, week of interviews through Virginia. Um, and he was my last one. And I, I just remember showing up and he's like, it was, he was just electric and tr- talking about all the th- different things he does uh, in terms of teaching, the research, um, and it, it was, it was an instant connection. I was just like, this is someone, especially after some of the interviews I've had, I, I just, I was like, I don't know if I can, you know, I didn't know if the other places were really a right fit for me. And, and it just, it just clicked right away. And I remember coming home, <laughs> talking to my wife and she's like, well, how did it go? And I was like, I, I think he offered me the jobs, but I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was a, he was a genius i mean he he really was a genius he was a, he's a, yeah a big loss to pediatrics um not being around but he was a mentor to me i mean clinically i learned so much from him um and he really let me explore my interests in a way that i don't think anyone else would i i remember even like about a year in you know so i'm only in practice a year i'm still learning what i'm doing i don't know what i'm doing right at one year out of training and the program at Innova uh, needed um, someone to really run the continuity clinic, which was kind of a patchwork at that point. It, it had kind of fallen apart with a curriculum, didn't really have one. And so this great opportunity came up that I got to know just in that year, he kept bringing me to grand rounds and meeting people. And so they got to know me and, and were like, hey, we'd like you to take this assistant program director position and, and really revamp the continuity you know, program. And I like, obviously I had to go to my boss and say, I'm going to need some time to do this. How do you feel about this? And I'm like, he didn't blink. (laughs) He's like, you got to do it. I'm like, Um. oh, okay. (laughs) And I don't, I don't know many bosses that a year out that'd be like, that take you away from, you know, generating and, um, you know, revenue and seeing people. No, he, 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 what what I remember about him is, um, (laughs) oh, he would shred people to pieces in those meetings. (laughs) And then, you know, the other thing I remember about, about him was uh, the, his technique of cleaning the nose on the kids, full, fill the bulb syringe with saline water and squirt it, and then the mucus would go flying out the other. 
bro. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'm like, like I'm cleaning, ears, ears and noses need to be cleaned. <laughs> I, I, I always year. ask him, how do you stay in practice with all these bougie women out here in Northern Virginia? Don't they like start hitting you when you do that? No, no, no they're used to me and I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that was really fun. Why did you leave that practice? You were there for 10 years. I was. I mean, it was an amazing experience. And I, I got to a part where I was really doing, you know, for, for me, I think we just I came to a path in the road where I just had very different vision for managing um, and, and this is where I'm so grateful for him. Cause I mean, during that time when I was there, I, I really got to stretch my legs and really get to learn how to run a practice and, and in some ways, ex, you know, try different things out. Um, I took business classes while I was there and he really kind of gave me the reins. Um, but I, I think the largest thing, we just had very different visions of where the practice was going as we were getting larger. Um, and, and so it was just a time I, I think was the right time for me, me to leave at that point. What were those differences? Oh, you're getting into the tough questions now. Yeah. Because um, I mean, the differences know, of a practice that's like, yeah, it's nothing. It wasn't, it wasn't the clinical stuff. It really oh. had to do with how the practice runs, putting, moving pieces of the puzzle in different places. So in terms of staffing, how, how we staffed, uh -huh. um, you know, I had put together a pretty extensive business plan um, and was, was starting to initiate that. And, you know, that with that comes unease, right? It's change and yeah. people's roles are changing. And so it, it, it's, it's, it's tough. I mean, I've, I've been through different places where those kinds of changes occur and I can see how it, it ruffles people's feathers and, and that uncertainty is tough for folks. Um, and you try to guide them through, but I, I think that is where some friction occurred um you know it's it and, and it rather than drive to further friction it just seemed the right decision to step away let him run things the way he he saw fit right yeah i guess they didn't want to change and pivot they just want to continue to coast yeah I, I think that's it it's, it's a disruption right and yeah. so it's you have to suddenly and, and and it's just tough it's like you've been doing things a certain way yeah it's working but as we know, if you don't change, it's... <laughs> yeah. I remember with my, senior, with, my, with my senior partner, when it was time for the EHR, he says, why do we want to do an EHR? I've been working like this for 30 years, so right. why would I want to put an EHR? You know, that's what they, they, they all do that. Because they're towards the end of their career, so why bother? Right. <laughs> well, I had a famous pediatrician tell me how bad computers were. And I said... I did remind him that, you know, at some point we were tasting urine to diagnose diabetes. And he told me that's a small price to pay to get rid of that machine. <laughs> so, <That's funny. laughs> he was kidding, but it was really funny. So then you've had tremendous success at uh, Einstein's pediatrics yeah, yeah. and um, probably your wife day is more successful than you are. Oh, I would hundred <laughs> percent. So how, how um, and so for those people that don't know what they did in her last business venture, what did yeah, she? Yeah, so she, I'm super proud of her. So she, um, and she, you know, she had a path where she worked for other companies, a lot of startups, and got a sense of what that looked like. Um, a lot of them went bust, <laughs> so yeah. she saw failure too. Um, and so she had she had a back injury actually. She had a a, an, a car accident and had a back injury. Um, and at that time was, you know, it was hard for her to sit. So she needed a desk that would allow her to work at, but not sit, um, which now they're on every, every target in every store. Right. Um, but she realized there was an opportunity there that at that time when she started, um, there weren't really standing desks. And, and so, yeah, that was where she, when she launched, um, her own company, she started in our basement. <laughs> <laughs> in our old house. Um, that was our warehouse for, for a while. Um, she were, actually worked with my dad. My dad helped her design her first desk, which was really cool to see them work together. See, so he did some prototypes because he had carpentry skills. So that's what's always funny. It's like Dave's not an engineer. She's she's not, you know, she had this company with, you know, building furniture <laughs> in the beginning. And that really wasn't her skill set. Her skill set was in analytics and um, uh, marketing. Um, and, and so it was very, very much kind of a stretch for her learning how to do production stuff. 
Um, and yeah, the company took off. She was one of the first three standing, really decent sized standing desk places in the US. Um, she uh, became kind of a darling of Amazon and spoke, I know at a few big conferences they had invited her to and invited her to uh, Capitol Hill to speak on behalf of small businesses. Um, wow. Yeah, it was really and cool. And you sold the company for millions and millions, right? Yeah, so I'm not, <laughs> I cannot disclose the amounts, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, she she built the company up and like a lot of entrepreneurs at that point, she, I mean, she wasn't wanting to have a large company that she served as CEO, so she sold um, to a larger corporation. Um, and yeah, nice. Nice. now she's on to right now. Right now she's, she's helping me with my practice, but she's actually onto another uh, entrepreneur. She's got another project she's working on now, which I can't disclose yet. <laughs> okay. So how does her way of thinking influence the way you manage the, your pediatric office? It, it was interesting. So when I started doing my business, I, I, I when I started, you know, at advance, started doing um, more of the business management side, um, I realized through her how important the marketing, how we, and, and really marketing to me was just, you know, it's another term for us motivating people to do good things for themselves. I mean, it's like people say marketing, they're ill, that's, you know, you're selling stuff, you're trying to convince people of stuff they don't need. But I'm like, actually, it's, it's, Part of it's motivational interviewing and how you present things to folks to, to motivate them to change and stuff. And so a lot of what I learned through her was, was that piece of things. And certainly starting a business, you know, getting the word out, learning how to, you know, get people to know when I started my practice, where I was, what I was doing and, and what was different about what we were doing um, yeah. was a piece of it. I still remember I, I was doing... So she had a lot of experience with her business and taught me a lot about, you know, just um, Google ads and, 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 and really getting up on the high, high end of the list and stuff. And at that time it was, it was, nobody was doing it. I, I was, it actually was really, really cheap. <laughs> I did not have to spend money, much money on the Google ads and stuff. Cause no one was in the space at that time. Um, totally different now, but it, it was, it was interesting. I, I definitely was able to get ahead. Um, on, on that piece compared to others where people just weren't occupying that space. And, and that, that was tremendously helpful. Yeah, um, do, you yeah. think that, do you think there's a lot of pediatricians putting Google ads now? There definitely, when I've looked, there's definitely more. I, I, I would say it's more the big hospital, because I was, what I was surprised, the big hospital systems really weren't occupying that space yet either. Um, and now they are. So what I generally see is not necessarily smaller practices, but like more of the large, practices and um, hospital systems putting putting stuff up now because they have the they have the budgets right they have the yes. marketing team so they have the people doing that yeah in the old days uh, marketing was a bad word it, and I still feel like when I talk to folks about it yeah I, I still feel people like ill that's not what we're about I'm not trying to you know it, and I'm I, I really think look more at the psychology of what it is uh -huh. it's like you're doing something amazing in your office. You need people to come and experience that. Um, it's good for their kids. They need to be vaccinated. And, you know, whether you want to use the word motivate or market, I mean, that's, they're, they're in many ways synonymous. You, you know, we, we get in front of ourselves as pediatricians. Look, we've been marketing since pediatrics has been a profession. And it used to be called the yellow book and the AP right. directory. And then we went to the nursery and we brought cookies to the nursery nurses so that they liked us and we were very polite to them so that they would let send us patients. You got it. And then we played golf with the obstetricians, you know, when that was a thing that doctors had time and money to do because we would show up for the C-sections and they liked us and then they would send us patients. And so we've been marketing since there has been a, a, a pediatric specialty. Um, and you know, we need to make money in order to stay in business. So man, money making is not a dirty word and everything in life is a sale. When I'm but that's very to... weird. If you Google any physician or most of the time, the physicians, their name does not even appear with their practice. You'll mm -hmm. get health grades and will appear with a mm -hmm. hospital or U S health news, but their practice name does not appear almost ever. It's hard to find them. 
Yeah. So yeah, I mean, and those are the folks that don't realize that the importance of that stuff, um, and mm-hmm. that they're letting others kind of dictate how people view yep. them, see them, and and it's hard. I mean, it is another piece of what we do being added, you know, another thing added to the pile. Yes. Um, but that's why you, you know, you try to get a good team around you that can help you where you where your blind spots are, where you don't have the skills. You don't have to have all these skills. Um, you just need to have people that do have those that can work with you. Great. And then um, what is trusted doctors and, and what, what was the motivation to stand that group up? Yeah. So trusted doctors um, is essentially um, a, the brainchild of Sandy Chung. People may have heard of her, <laughs> the <laughs> president, right? Um, I've been friends with Sandy, um, gosh, gosh, since 2006, seven. Um, when I first moved to the area, I got to know her real early and, and she brought me on as, as a board member at the local medical society in, in Northern Virginia. Um, so we had been talking, she had been talking to me a long time about this idea of, of allowing for our practices to coexist and, and collaborate, um, and, and, but utilize our togetherness to negotiate better contracts, um, kind of share resources that are redundant that we all need. Um, and so, yeah, out of that came trusted doctors. And so, you know, we all, the, we have multiple, we call them divisions, what used to be our individual practices. They're technically trusted doctor divisions. We share a tax ID. Um, our billing goes through a central agent, you know, a central part of the organization. Um, and then, um, you know, we're working together on clinical um, and, and clinical goals um, in terms it's, of- So it's very much a, 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 a practice without walls model. Yeah, and that's right. But, you know, I think the important thing, and I think what Sandy, I, I, I think a barrier, and I will tell you, Dr. Schwartz would like, it definitely would have been a barrier for him, is that, you know, that desire to continue to be autonomous and make decisions on the day to day, and how you practice. And I think trusted doctors have struck, stricken that nice balance. There are certain things that we certainly, and I, and I think for most of us, it's the stuff that we, we know are important, but we're not too much into the fine details of how our 401k is administered and the health plan stuff that, you know, that we can, we can all compromise on those things. Um, but still at the practice level, I, you know, if you go into the, the patients, when they walk in my practice, you know, from the time before I was part of trusted doctors to after, I don't think they would be able to tell you the difference. Right. And, and are you all an OP or you can choose? Yeah, your- so we've, we've narrowed it down. There's two. So, um, there's a, a, I think three of us are on OP, the rest are on e-clinical. Yeah. I hope you don't have to change the clinical. So no, the plan is we've, there's enough of us doing that, that we have in this, where the billing side, we have enough billers to that go around that some are experts in the OP and some in e-clinical. And so the intention is no, yeah. where that the, the practices come in and have to make a choice between those two though. Okay. How do you um, like do quality metrics? Cause they're different. So yeah, there's, so we do some, you know, obviously some is going to come through the, the billing stuff, but we're actually doing a project um, called Fortify where, and we're actually part of the children's health network in Northern Virginia as well, where that data is being put as well. So we're, it, it's in the process, but we're building the capacities where this data is going to be de-identified and pooled. Yeah. And so we'll be able to, to look as a larger entity, what, what, and as well as what the divisions individually are doing. We have some of that now through the payers, but it's all, it's all payment based, right? It's all that, which isn't show everything, right. um, but we're going to be sharing actually the clinical side as well. Mm-hmm. And then what, what motivated you to run the Virginia chapter of the AAP? Um, my gullibility. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> no, no, no. Who, who, so it's, who, it's funny you who, ask. Who, who threw you in the pool while you were drunk? <laughs> <laughs> well, all things lead back to Sandy Chung. That's okay. <laughs> I will tell you in Northern Virginia, all things lead back. So Sandy's definitely in the mix of how I got to be there. It's funny. I will tell you as a medical student and resident, I did not engage in AAP stuff at all. So when I've gone back and some of my friends from then, they're like, they saw that I was, you know, the chapter president and they're like, 
how? <laughs> like you like because they all were really engaged in it and it's funny I I think of my close friends I think I moved up the highest of all of them in terms of the organization um I, I think it was you know being on the management side and seeing how things and you know I'm a fixer and I'm just like this is ridiculous like why does this happen you know I think we've all asked those questions and then we yes. and a lot of people just go on the way well that's the way it is I'm just you know I don't have time um I was like no 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 <laughs> I can't let things go. <laughs> it's like I need to. I need to start. I need. I need to figure out a way to, to work on this stuff. Um, and then, yeah. And then, uh, you know, overlapping with that was sort of Sandy bringing me in locally on stuff. Um, and I, yeah, it just came from that. I, I, I was involved with the Medical Society of Northern Virginia. That was the first one. And then I, I became a delegate for the MSV or Medical Society of Virginia which wasn't a good fit for me The just, I, I, it, it was it, just the way the organization run. I, I d- didn't find a home there. And then Sandy had already moved over to the chapter. And it's like, you should come check this out, what we're doing. And so I became the Northern Virginia representative. And I was like, oh, this is, this is great. I mean, I was just, they, they were working on stuff on the payment side. They had some great immunization projects going. I mean, it was, and the people were just, I connected with. Um, right. So much so, I mean, even I remember when I started my practice, the person um, that did a lot of work on the payment side, I had some issues early on, and they were able to step in and, and make connections for me and saved me, I'm not exaggerating, at least 30000 probably closer to $40,000 that I would have mm-hmm. lost. Um, and so, I mean, that alone, I was like, I've got to, <laughs> oh, I, wow. I can't, I can't, I, can't I, I have to contribute <laughs> to an organization that's helped me so much. And so I just felt it was my response. So much has been given to me, Dr. Schwartz, the the chapter, and I just it was like it was time to give back um, right. for me. And so yeah, I just kind of yeah. worked up the chain at that point. What what did you know, what do you think was your biggest win while you were president of the chapter? So when I went in as chapter president, you all recall there was no COVID <laughs> right before I was getting prepped and ready, and then as I was getting closer, COVID came. So I had this huge agenda. <laughs> It's going to do out the window that went. And, and, and I honestly think I'm probably the right person for it. Cause it, it was, a, I think looking back, I'm like, I'm pretty flexible. I'll bounce with things. And it, that's, I mean, that was COVID for two years, right. It, yep. it was adjusting, making constant pivots and adjustments. And I'm a pretty open person to change and hearing different perspectives, even when I go into a pretty hard stance. Um, and so I, I think for me it was just doing that pivoting and, and at each step, identifying the needs for the pediatricians in Virginia. I mean, the earliest thing I remember doing is we like getting masks, <laughs> you know, get, getting just face masks, getting supplies that were, in, that people couldn't get. And we, I saw someone doing it at a local level. I'm like, why don't we just do this at the state? Um, and so I, you know, we kind of had five regions, I set, you know, started to set things up and take orders from people and started collecting stuff to the point I couldn't even accept all the stuff. There were, there, there was a company that was trying to give us, I can't even remember, like three or four truckloads of stuff, but I had nowhere to put it. Oh, wow. <laughs> so it was a good problem. But I think it was that, I mean, I think for us, each, at each step, something new was occurring and responding to it. Um, and really, utilizing effectively communication, kind of multi-channel communications with folks. Um, So, you know, we started listservs at that point regionally. Um, We started really, you know, have, I did some live stuff like this some podcast type stuff really. And and then started, I think we ended up running 30 plus different webinars and things um, and really putting those pieces in place um, and, and, I think all of that was uh, was because of COVID and, and each as things changed and the needs that were happening. Um, yeah, you you did a great job. I mean, people are very happy with what you did. I was I was you know in the middle of it, you're like, oh my god, I hope this is making a difference, right? You're like, I was probably working ninety hours a week. I I I was working. I, you know, Saturday and Sunday was for catch up. <laughs> yeah, now you did a phenomenal job. Everybody says you did a phenomenal yeah, job. I'm, I'm, Thank I'm, you for that. I, I hope it. I, I'm hoping I helped. I mean, I hope I made it yes. a little bit and easier. Then, it was a and then you also you also pushed across the goal line, uh, Medicaid reimbursement, right? Yeah, 
You, you, yeah. you didn't get to 100 percent of Medicare, but you got it from 50. We keep pushing. I mean, that that battle happened before me and will continue. That's been a, a target of the chapter for a long time, and we'll keep we'll keep pushing. <laughs> it's, we're not why done. is that? Why is that? Why is that important? You know, it's you know, it's one of the huge barriers to providers even taking Medicaid. We don't, I mean, even our region, we don't have it. I mean, honestly, across the state, we don't have enough people taking it. And understandably, the reimbursement so much less. Um, and it's getting harder and harder. Those margins are getting leaner and leaner. Um, so, you know, I, I see places like, you know, the Innova Cares Clinic that can't run in the clear because they're not being paid for what they do. Um, and while Innova can absorb that, those of us in private practice can't. <laughs> it's right. like I need, I, I can't, I, I can't, right. I can't, right. I can't work and pay. <laughs> right. and so, so we, we we need to make money to pay rent. We need to make money yeah. to pay our mortgage. We need to make money to treat our staff properly. Yep. And if we don't, you know, if we're losing money, we won't serve anyone. No, and we can't hire good people. We can't. I mean, it, it just tumbles in and and. And you guys probably know this better than I mean. We're headed towards troubled waters ahead with with having enough providers, staff, in primary care in general, not just pediatrics, but primary care. And I mean, we're headed over the ledge. And I'm not sure. I, I know. I, Here's I, I, my own soapbox on this. What are your thoughts on uh, student loan forgiveness? Because you, as a private physician or an enterprise, your office is not designated as a an underserved area, you may be uh, servicing a lot of Medicaid and Child Health Plus, a medically underserved population, yet nobody cares. And across the street could be the Novo Health Center right. that bought, bought up Dr. Bravo's little practice. And all of a sudden that practice is an underserved area or, and then they could get loan forgiveness in that office. Yeah. Oh, I, I think it's, I think it's a great tool. And I, you know, when we're doing, like the, go back to my, my, chapter hat <laughs> on the executive board, you know, one of the things that we're constantly seeing is encroachment of scope of practice, and it's always driven by access. And it's like, this is, this is the kind of tool, if you want people to go to a particular area, you know, Southwest Virginia, this is the perfect tool to get people down there. But what we keep doing is giving, you know, non-physicians, privileges to do other things that ne not necessarily trained to do out of that desire for access. Um, and then they're not going to those regions. Right. That's my favorite part of this. So that's another, but the, the honest truth is there are many counties in the U S that do not have a pediatrician period. Yep. Right. And there are very, very many areas, uh, even in Northern Virginia where access is very limited yeah. uh, to a pediatrician. And um, I think we are over, I mean, I think we're over, over the cliff. This is do change now or we're, we, we are in deep trouble. Yeah, you can't just pull this out of that. The only, the only thing, and this is my fear, is that we're creating, the gap's going to keep getting wider. And so you're not going to have doctors to pull from. They're going to start giving others the same privileges. I had well, a discussion, I had a dialogue today with somebody at the AP level in the advocacy and uh, basically talking about the underserved areas and medically underserved populations. And I, I told him, I said, listen, my office has 20,000 patients, 65 of which, 65% Medicaid and Child Health Plus. We have like 15, 16 doctors. This year alone, we had four candidates that we could have recruited that came to our office as children. We saw them when they were born. Right. Perfect candidates, right? For a great story coming home. They went down the street to a federally qualified health center or the non-for-profit, literally a half a mile away, servicing the same population of people because they had student loans. They couldn't come to us for that because of that reason. Now, right. you know, what was amazing to me when they stated to me was, well, Dr. Rogel, you seem to be the only one complaining about this. That's weird, right? Well, it's well, terrible, I actually. I, I want to get away from this means testing. We don't means test public schooling in America. So we have already a shortage of primary care doctors. Mm -hmm. Try to see an adult endocrinologist for your type 2 diabetes. It's a six-month wait. Yep. Okay. E even if you have insurance, if you have wanted to pay cash, it's like 
can't help you. I I'm booked for six months. I can only see as an endocrinologist 10 patients a day. Right. Each yeah. patient's 45 minutes. Yep. And so let's stop talking about Medicaid and let's stop about a chip and this and that. Every child deserves to have a pediatrician in every county. If you go into community pediatrics and you're community based, whether you're employed by um, RBK Pediatrics, Einstein's Pediatrics, your independent contractor like I am, you know, there should be loan forgiveness uh, because we need access to pediatric care for everybody. The white kid, the black kid, the brown kid, the yellow kid, the tall kid, the short kid, the gay kid, the heterosexual kid, the boys, the girls, they all deserve. There is no means testing, just like they all deserve primary and high school education. Well, that gets wishful doctor. thinking, Herb. That's really wishful thinking. You no, no, might be able to get start. you might be able to get something with Medicaid and Child Health Plus because these are all federally, you know, programs. Right. But um you know, I, I made the, the person realize that my office is located in, it's not an underserved area, it's not a rural area, but if I can't hire doctors and the office starts to dwindle and we close, the 20,000 patients that we service, 21,000 patients that we have, all of a sudden we'll have no doctor. And then you know what? Comac will become a medically underserved area. Right. And then, you know, um, I'm old enough to remember when we didn't get paid for the vaccines. and we would do the well child exam and then send the patient to the health department where the nurse would give the vaccine. And if we do not, if we do not value pediatricians, if we do not address their student debt and we don't pay them enough to stay in business, we're going to go back to the point where children don't get well child exams. They go to the health department, they get vaccinated and that's all the care they get. Yeah. And that is not what we want for America. That is not going to produce a strong democracy and is not going to produce a strong country. So I need all pediatricians to stop talking about Medicaid and start saying, we need to be paid fairly and we need to be paid fairly today. And every child without means testing needs access to a residency trained pediatrician. That is what's fair. That's equitable. That's inclusive. Yeah. That's DEI. Um, you know, let's just stop with the nonsense. Yeah. That's really what we should be all saying together, arms in arms. Yeah, I wishful thinking, Herb. Well, George, if we don't dream, it will not happen. Yeah, I do I think we have to. I think we do have to start being, and I think at the at, at not just at, at the national. I think we are attempting to be louder with that message because more falling. I, mean, I will say there's a shift in what in, in practice we're seeing as well. I mean, we're definitely doing more complex things because of the limitations. I mean, in Northern Virginia, we've got two hospital systems, two children's hospitals. And like you're saying, it, there's a way, I mean, you know, yeah. for it, I you mean, for multiple specialties. You can't see a neurologist. Yeah. Psychiatrist I mean, in Northern Virginia is two years wait. Yeah. yeah. And, and so I, you know, it's, there's definitely more incumbent on us as pediatricians for managing than there was when I started. Um, and I just don't like, I don't see how you do that without more P I mean, it's that workforce has to come from somewhere that has some training in the stuff. I mean, I, I probably see a quarter to a third of my day is mental health now. Yeah. And that takes some skill. I mean, that's not, you know, I'm starting to get my younger physicians trained to do that, but it, it, it takes skill and time and yeah. It's yeah. just blocking our schedules up more as we take on. You know, even with the mental health, health, you know, the, um, you, if you're a mental health center or behavioral health center, developmental center, you're qualified for loan forgiveness. Yes. But Dr. Martin, you're just a pediatrician. That's right. Who cares? Right. Nobody right. cares about Dr. Rogu and Dr. Martin. Yep. And then, um, uh, yeah, no, we, we need to change that. Obesity is a big, a big problem. It's yeah. very time consuming. It's very important. Yeah. I, I joke with my radiologist friends that, you know, through most of my career, I never ordered an MRI <laughs> because if a kid has a, a weird headache or post con concussion sy symptoms, I would send them to a neurologist yep. first. But now no they would one would order the MRI. But, well, but at least they would know when to and when not to. They order on everybody. 
But nowadays, it's like I can't get them to see the neurologist. So I'll order the MRI and treat their migraines, you know, with Sulfren and Motrin until they can get an appointment. Yeah, no, there's a, there's a lot of that we're doing to patch the time and, and that, and that's where like, I'm more and more, I'm taking on more complex stuff that I'm like, there's a discomfort with what I'm doing, but I, I, I've got to do what I've got to, I mean, somebody like, if I don't, then who will? No one will. That's, that's our, that's our, that's part of our problem sometimes in pediatrics is that we're always wanting to help and we overextend ourselves. I think we're givers. Um, and, and, but you know, that's where I think on the advocacy side, we have to, there are times we have to be like enough's enough. I'm not doing like, and we, we have to, and we just, I mean, part of this, I, I do very much strongly feel it has to come not just from us, but from those we serve, um, the families and they're the voters and they're the people who have to push back to um, that just us and we're a relatively small group. Um, but we, but I think when, everyone starts to feel the pain. We have to educate them on why that's happening. <laughs> yes. And so I think at the chapter level, the AAP has done a phenomenal job of advocating for pediatricians. Yeah. I'm always amazed how much, I mean, I, I have to I tell you a little bit of a funny story with my, my nurse practitioner was in the office in the middle of all this COVID stuff. And I probably looked 20 years older <laughs> and sleep deprived. And she's like, ah, oh, Dr. Martin, I hope they pay you a lot of money for doing this. <laughs> I just laughed. I was like, she's like, what? I'm like, we don't get paid. We're all volunteers. Right. There's right. no money. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't know if there's a communication gap at the, at the Chicago AAP. Yeah. But it really does not feel that they have my back as a practicing pediatrician at the Chicago AAP. I and I think, I think that needs to be changed because without pediatricians, there are no healthy children. Without healthy children, we don't have a country. Um, you know, so it's like what I tell the mothers in the exam room over and over again. In case of an emergency, put the oxygen mask on your face first, then take care of the child. Because yeah, without a mom, I can't take care of the kid. I'll, t I'll tell if you. If you think got... about it, without pediatricians, what will happen next? There'll yeah. be more AAP because there'll be no more members. Well, there won't be a society because children need to be healthy and cared for. We don't want them just to get shots at the at the at the health department from a nurse that can't do developmental screening, that can't address their mental health needs. But what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I, I have to tell you, so this, I, and I've gotten this, I got it at the chapter two where people didn't feel we represented them. Um, this was, a few, I, I feel like we're in a better place now, but it, there's, you still get some of that. Um, I think we made some inroads in it. And I, I get the same, the disconnect that pediatricians feel with the national organization that happens. I think for the chapter, I will definitely say, and I think national is a victim of this. I think sometimes there's not an, enough communication to let you know what's being done. Um, there's a lot of things done behind closed doors and being like when we were doing advocacy stuff, I don't think people knew. And that that when I joined the board, I, I do remember, and that was a real push for us to start being better about how we communicate and really pushing that out and engaging folks in discussions about what they wanted us to do. Um, and so I do think of the chapter, we made a very mindful effort and I think COVID helped even accelerate that. Um, I think there are efforts at national and recognition of that disconnect um, because I do think there's, a, I mean, I, like a lot of these people you've had on here to interview, I, there's amazing people They're amazing. doing work really on amazing. our behalf that are doing yeah. stuff that I think the majority of people don't even know they're doing. Right, right. <laughs> right. Their right. story needs to be told. Their story needs to be told. And I, and yes. I think figuring out how to best do that. Um, I just, I always say like, I just, in medicine, this was one of the things we were always behind like 15 years of business practices, you know, in terms of how we run our practices. Like yeah. it's really fascinating to see, but I think that carries over to some of our organizational stuff too. Yes. There's that they, it runs a little bit like an organization did 10, 15 years ago. Oh, well, no, the AAP runs like- More than that. Okay, I'm being nice. 
50 years. It's not, it's not I, work I, with I these people. So, think, so you, you got Flick and Clack they, over here, two knucklehead doctors that figured out how to <laughs> elevate pediatricians. Very with difficult. The, with a zero budget. With a zero budget. With a zero budget. You know? no, but but here, here, I don't think the AAP has realized yet that monkey survey can survey 60,000 people with one button. <laughs> and you can you can you can ignore the, the the feedback, right? I mean, say the obesity guidelines, right? You could have put it out to the 60,000 pediatricians for a review and given them 48 hours to look at it. And on a survey monk, you say, you think this is doable at your, at your, wherever you are, you know, like private practice, hospital, academia, and, you know, gotten a report back. You might choose to re ignore the report, but now people felt hurt. Yeah. Right. And, and it's monkey survey. It's $230 a year for 10,000. And, and there's. There were a lot of different ways, right? You could have, I mean, it's time, but it's, I mean, I've seen organizations where they, you know, there's all these conferences across states and stuff where this stuff could have been presented there. Here are some of the things we're working on. Right. Looking for, I mean, there's different ways one could do you that. Could do, do it, it but, but I'm just saying, schools. you want to do it cheap. You yeah. want to reach yeah, everybody. Yeah, yeah. It's I called monkey survey. Yeah. And that's been around for years. Yep. No, I get you. Right. Yep. So, so I think that's where you feel that disconnect. Like, I don't know who they are. I don't even know who the board members are. You know, I mean, I don't I think it's I think it's interesting what you're saying because I think in a lot of ways they did it the other way. They put a lot of time once it was out and getting and discussing what it meant, right? And telling you yes. why they did what they did. Um making it a little more transparent on the formation part, things working on, including it's, it's a different model. It's a, di I mean, it's, right. it's, it's the old model. And, and I, yeah. I totally understand it. Because I, I grew up in the time that if you wanted to go read a journal, you had to be affiliated with a medical center and go to the medical, you know, the, the medical library, the big hospital. Yeah. And they had all the journals and, you know, they could pull them out and you photocopy that and you take it home. We don't need that anymore. We yeah. don't need a huge library in Chicago yep. with all the textbooks and it's called up to date. It's called Google. Yep. It's called Bing. And you know, for 15, $25, I can download any, 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 uh, you know, and met plus any article I want, read it and figure it out. So we, yep. we are no longer bastions of walled off knowledge that we used to be before the internet came and the internet came before 2000. Don't forget internet's old. It's chat GBT. Now you just tell chat GBT what you want and it'll pull it for you. <laughs> yeah. George <laughs> loves chat GBT. <laughs> I, I, I think it's such a, I think it just gives me, it works. <laughs> it does. But th th there is, there is going to be a place for chat, chat GBT four, not three um, in healthcare. And some people are already working on that. It's called carbon, for example. Mm -hmm. And they they really will create your note from listening into what you're doing. One hundred percent. That's the direction. It's so great. Yes. We're doing we're database entry right now. Yes. Yeah. We're, right. We're, it doesn't make thinking, any sense. At the oh, talk about poor management, right? You you get the person that makes the most income for the for the company, the most revenue, the most highly trained. And you turn them into a data entry clerk. Right. Yeah, no, it, it, it never made sense. That was genius. Yeah, that was genius. This is genius, and I'm not going to say who who did that to us because I get in trouble. But that was a genius idea. It was. I I, I look at it. It's going to be a very small piece of history, and it really was just. It's going to be a very. I mean, I I knew it was be this direct. I knew this was a temporary thing. And I, this is the technology that's going to, I mean, the people who need to be worried are actually, and I'm happy because they drive me nuts. It's the EHR companies. Yeah. <laughs> they wanted, they wanted to like charge us for this and that. And the AI is going to take a lot of what they do away from them. They're not, you're not going to need it. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'm using the chat GPT within my EHR where I tell it, write me a, history yeah. of illness for yeah. a child with a sore throat. It writes me some words, yeah. a paragraph. I fix it up a little bit because it's never good. 
And then I drop it into these uh, phrase construction places. And I talk to the patient. I know what I'm going to ask. Whoop, put that button. I got a paragraph. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've, even used it. I've even used it on some uh, rebuttal letters for insurance negotiations. You know, when I was big on the COVID testing mm -hmm. and I went into ChatGPT, and said, write me a rebuttal letter to the evil empire about uh, not covering COVID testing or whatever. Oh my God, you want to cry after that. <laughs> How could you not cover COVID testing on little poor children? Yep. yep. So Mike, Mike, what challenges do you still think that we face as a, as a profession right now? What, like top of the line? Um, oh, there's a long list. I hate to say it that way. I'm, I, I still, I want to start by saying I still love what I do. <laughs> I think it's an amazing thing. We that We still do. love what we do. Yeah. Go I mean, work. I still love it. Yeah. Um, cause that's where I look at, I look, you know, I'm sort of at that middle age, right. Where everyone starts to question and they get their sports car and they question their decisions they've made. I have no doubts that pediatrics was the right decision and, and I'm grateful for it every day I go to work. You're a rock star. Um, no, no, it's just a fun field. Where else can you go in? You smile. The kids, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's a happy place. Yeah, it's definitely. We got um, the best job in the and world. It brings joy and it's, and it's, it's important. That's the other thing. I always, this is the conversation I always have with my wife because it, it's it like, she can make so much more money than me, but I'm, I'm like, I'm doing more important work. <laughs> <laughs> You are. You're not going to show this to her, right? No, I, I would her. not say that to my <laughs> wife. So challenges. Um, I, 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 I think the insurance piece is just always is the big bear in the room, and and I, I don't, I don't, you know, I, it's just getting the margins are getting tighter, and we have to, you know, you can only run things ever so more, more efficiently, and so I that has not been fixed by anything and so I, I still think on the payment side is still one of the biggest things for us is getting recognition for what we do um i look at other countries who dollar you know you know you know the dollars they put into primary care whereas our country inverts it and puts it into all the specialty care <laughs> right and i'm like right. and and one of many reasons why our outcomes aren't as good um, cause we try, we, we let there become problems that need fixing rather than prevent problems. Um, but unfortunately in the models, you know, and this is where I think the AP is definitely doing work is looking at guides as to what's important and what should be rewarded in the payment system. That's going to lead to good outcomes for kids. And, and that's always, that, that's the challenge is the insurance company looks two years ahead we need to be looking 30 15, to 40, 20, yeah. right? And so that to me is really where a lot of change is happening. And, and I think we're making headway in, in getting them at the table and having pediatricians decide what those should be, but still a lot of challenges with that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you're right. I think the, the, financing of healthcare where we cheat the kids and we uh under invest in their health and their well-being yep. it's really uh costing us a tremendous amount yep. so um kaiser permanente has a study that says the average medicaid uh, child spends two thousand dollars a year while the elderly is spending 13 to fifteen thousand dollars a year on medicaid right um and but but all the time we hear, well, uh, you you had this many preventable ER visits and you had this many preventable hospitalizations and you wrote for this brand name only here that cost this much money. Are you kidding me? The kid's costing $2,000 a year. How much leaner do you think we can get? And that that's, I, I have to tell you, it's, yeah, it's crazy. We have one of our payers is wanting to decrease us 8%. And with inflation, our costs going up, they want to decrease what they're paying us 8%. How is that a good idea? That, that, I'm like, and I'm just like, that's exactly it. I'm like, how many, how, how much are you going to, how much more are you going to squeeze out of? <laughs> like, you, you know yeah. where that's coming. I don't think Innova's doing this, but you know where they, they are doing it in Long Island. You know where that's coming is you, you check into the ER today, you get the multi 
respiratory panel screen. Yeah. That's $1, fifty, twelve hundred dollars. So right. that you know that's going out of their margin. So they're looking for you know someone to take a haircut. Yeah. And the pediatricians are the easy haircut. Because you're not going to complain. You're going to say thank you. Give well, me and so that's that's the message. Yes. You have to complain, and and you have to. Yes. And this is where it's hard, but going toe to toe and saying we're not going to take your insurance then. Yes. Well, that's not. That's the, the only. That's, that's, that's the, the only answer. leverage you have. No, I, I George, I think sometimes it, it is like there's some managed care Medicaid plans that pay you know like fifty percent of what regular Medicaid pays, and that's people right. still take them. They don't even know they're taking them. Yeah. You know, they, so no, okay, I'm not going to take that because this other managed care Medicaid is paying me two times as much as you are paying me for the same work. Sorry. Yeah. And those patients will switch over to the to the other Medicaid plan. Well, that power you do have to, to, the, to guide them into a different plan. You can call the ones yeah, that of course. pay more to come in for their routine checkups. And ultimately, this company will have poor heat measures, and they'll have poor reports and poor quality and so forth and so on. Yeah. And yeah. those guys usually don't care about pediatrics. That's why they do that. Well, then fine. Then, you know, then. If they have to have it. They have to have a pediatric presence. Yeah. But if people put their, their big boy's pants on or skirts or whatever they put on, you know, below the waist, then. They tighten their belt and they go, I'm not going to put up with it. And 90% of the pediatricians in Virginia will not take plan number X because of unfair reimbursement practices. Guess what? Things will change. Well, that's where the but, problem but, comes but in. But if we're wimps and we don't do anything. You can't do that because of regulations. You there is no flat. regulation. Well, you're, you're, you're unionizing doctors. You're mobilizing doctors. You're organizing no. doctors against the company. I, no. Yes, it's a problem. It's not a problem to say... Medicare fee schedule is a hundred dollars for nine nine two one three. Say I don't know what it is right now, but say if a payer gives you less than fifty, you know, less than fifty percent for nine nine two one three compared to Medicare, then you should not participate in that plan. There's nothing illegal about that. No, there's nothing illegal about that. What the illegality is, you convincing Dr. Martin and myself. Right. To not okay, well, that's different. If that's I was talking saying, specifically yeah, about the evil empire, yeah, and you know, and to the, just to the two of you in a closed room, and we were all within a three mile radius, and we all agreed to dump the evil empire in the same week, yes. But to, to educate pediatricians to say, if someone's paying you 50% of Medicare, you cannot make money, drop right. that plan, yeah, you can't drop that plan. Do, do, do the community a service, drop the plan because that will send a strong message and the people will move over to another insurance company or they will change their ways because they need access to pediatricians. Yes. But what I, we I, do, I, what I, we do I, I do think strongly that's the answer. And I agree, like we can't all get in a room and, and discuss this stuff. But if we all, as a general rule, are not letting ourselves take let plans take advantage of us it it's going to disseminate right i mean it's yeah. multiple people doing this and you know I, I think at the end of the day it's like the truth is like we're in areas where there's not enough pediatricians and you do that they're gonna have to deal with us yes. because there's not yeah. enough of us <laughs> hey if that happens it'll become a medically underserved area and then you can get your loan forgiveness True. True. And, and we all get what we want. <laughs> See, I knew we could. <laughs> Everyone down. <laughs> so I'm always happy when I talk. <laughs> a good episode. I like being I like being grumpy and cynical. And then I, I hear your laughter and I'm like, well, well, life could be better. But I mean, this is I mean, this is all really important stuff. And and I, I think this is, you know, as individuals our voice doesn't carry as much, certainly saying no to insurance plan, but this is the stuff that the AP, we need them for. Right. And, and there's, and we have to have, like, we, we need someone sitting at the big boys table with the big plans and the leadership in those plans and having these discussions, like this doesn't make sense. This has to change. Um, and, and we do need a union and it's not illegal to unionize as long as you're an employee physician. Right. If you're employed, you could be unionized. You 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 just can't be employed and all. I mean, unionized and be the owner of the business. 
um, you know, and if the AP doesn't change its communication skills and doesn't have the right leadership, a union's coming because more and more physicians are fed up of the working conditions, um, you know, and the reimbursement. And, you know, physicians are very unhappy. They're burning out and they're quitting mid-career. Yeah. Um, now yeah. that's been, I, the, I, I will say, having gone through COVID, both pre post, uh, that's been the scariest thing uh, for me is just seeing the overall morale. Yeah. Um, it's really down. Um, the morale is down. The applicants are down. Heck, we're using three headhunter corporations and we can't locate a candidate. Yeah. Three. It's not like you're calling residency programs. Yeah. No, uh, it's it's a shortage it's, is here. A shortage is here. Oh, yeah. And it's, yeah, it's I mean, that's the thing. It's already here, but it's gonna get worse. And that's yes. like you're not seeing yes. mobilization and you're kind of like, um Yes, yes. No. And you know what's worse is that I'm a little bit older than you. Yeah. Like by about a decade. <laughs> and so I'm more likely to start getting sick and needing an internist. And yeah. there's none of them. Yeah. There's no you can't find an internist. They're all well, working. It's, no, it's hard. They and all work at twelve hour shifts at the hospital for three fifty, and they're on a week, off a week, on a week, and they love their lives. No, they don't. Um, well, I have a lot of friends at hospitals. They don't love their lives. Well, it's better than the intern is. You know, that's not making any money, and seeing okay. all these complex patients. Yeah. You know, in a little you know two person office, and is sweating how they're going to pay for you know. That their staff this week. You know, I, I want to say that my internist, he's doing a spectacular job. I go there, he has yes. access to care. You call up for appointments. You but he has nine, nine nurse for t practitioners. Stop. Let one. me finish the story. <laughs> so I always get to see him because I am Dr. Rogu MD. The staff knows to book me with him. But if it was anybody else, they'll see his nine nurse practitioners. That's the new model. Well, I don't want that for the kids. Yeah, it's gonna happen. No, it's not. You're now you're being like <laughs> you know who. Well, you know what? I am starting to get drained. You know, our our line was primary care when you wanted, urgent care when you needed, services provided by physicians. Great line, right? Yep. Great practice. Because we're having this crunch, I gave in and it killed me to hiring NPs. But we you don't have anybody yet. We didn't do it, but we're starting to look. But do you, you didn't find the candidates that you were that you thought you were comfortable with. Well, they all went to the the system. Okay. Well, no, I'm the nurse practitioners. None of them were experienced. Oh no, those guys. They were, none of them were experienced. They were fresh grads. I, I'm gonna have a 22 year old taking care of a meningitis or something. No, thank you. And so, but what I think the future uh, payment has to be addressed. Our, the way we are treated as human beings has to be changed. That has to be front and center at the AAP in Chicago. It has been front and center at the AAP at the state level, but not at the AAP in Chicago. We need a leader that will put that front and center because the shortage is here, the crisis is now, and the change needs to happen now. But I do think, because I'm an optimistic after two bourbons, yeah, uh, <laughs> that. Um, Where's mine? I didn't see. Uh, I know. I know. I'm show. still. I'm still in. I'm still in Brian's office. I can't. I, I think we office. gotta get. I think we gotta get Dr. Bravo to be the AAP president of Virginia. <laughs> oh no! No! <laughs> we no! We gotta no, get no. me to be AAP president no. of New York. No, my God! No, I'm no not a good politician. I tell people what I think, <laughs> and in their face. And that's why, so I got to tell you, I'm the same. I'm pretty direct. I think that's why my, I, I think people in my practice, like get the, like I, I cut to the chase. So we have a lobbyist um, at the chapter, hugely important, but I had to get, a, there was, there was a number of text messages sent to me to keep me <laughs> <laughs> preemptively. Don't speak. Don't, don't say oh, this. Stick to the talking point. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I think that uh, as you alluded, and I am going to be political. Uh -oh. um, the Obama administration was uh, snickered or um, poorly advised into foisting the cash register in front of the of the American physician. Um, that system was not ready for prime time. It was a waste of money. 
But I do think that we're at the brink of where artificial intelligence, nat natural language processing is going to make that system usable and it's going to make us more efficient. Yeah. And where I see the change coming, which is going to be difficult for us older physicians, is that instead of nurse practitioners and physician assistants, which are also expensive, they, they, they gather uh, good salaries. We're going to move to a more team-based approach where we're going to have LPNs that are particularly trained in development, LPNs that are particularly trained in um, you know, patient safety, LPNs that are particularly trained in um, diet and nutrition. Well, this is all nursing work anyway. And they're going to do all that heavy lifting and may maybe even mental health. I mean, cognitive behavioral therapy is not rocket science as long as somebody teaches you how to do it and you have the time to do it. And so we might be seeing 50 patients like NOLA is doing in Alabama, but we're not going to be doing the work that is way below our level of, you know, training. So the nurse will come, she'll, she'll, she'll do the weight, she'll tell the parent the weight's good, it's not good, the BMI is this, this is a nutritious thing. The other nurse will come in, do the development, the other nurse will come in, do the safety stuff for the kid. When I come into the room, I'm going to talk about what's important to the parent and what gaps the nurses have identified for me. And then I'll go on to the next room. And then everybody's going to say, you're not doing nothing and everybody else did your job. That's the way it works. That's the way the world works. See, I, I'm envisioning, and this may be unique to my region, that after that goes happen, the patients, the fan, the parents are going to ask me all the same stuff again. <laughs> it, it's quite, it's quite possible. <laughs> it's quite possible. But but you know what I mean? If all this, I don't need to score another ASQ3. A staff member can Oh, do. I agree with you. I think the this this these sort of redundant tasks. I, I, I 100%. But I do think it's, I, at least in the population I serve, I'm like, they're not ready for it either. They, they're going to have to be brought into it too, because. Yeah. Well, I, you like, know, that's when you go, if you want, if you want me to be doing all this, my concierge fee is three grand. Right. A year. <laughs> and, and that then, may be. What's and then we know that. I'll spend an hour with you. You'll see even in Northern Virginia, where they're driving the huge escalades that are a hundred thousand dollars. As soon as you say it's three grand per kid, they go like, well, we'll go through their normal process. Thank you. Oh, they do. It's like, it's like the after hours calls we do like at my practice, we do put a fee on it just to cut down the volume. Yes. I, had, I had a, I had a mob call 20 times in two months after hours and never, never came in for a visit, just used it as a, Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, this is ridiculous. <laughs> what else have what else have do you want to share with the national audience that I haven't asked you? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's you know, we're talking about the things that the changes you want at national AP, the stuff at the chapter. Like I said, there's no money in it. I'm sorry, it's it's <laughs> pediatrics, right? But we, we need people. I mean, and it's it it can be small, it can be big. It's we have, you know, there if there's things that you're seeing and that you have especially an interest and expertise in, it's like, there's a place for you. Um, and, and I know I'm, I'm doing a lot, you know, working with residents and medical students, kind of bringing them up in that culture. It's like, you need to engage. Um, like I didn't <laughs> when I was yeah. at that stage. Yeah. I, I just didn't understand the value of it. Now being out, I'm like this, this it, it's, you determine your future and it's, and you can be on the sidelines or you can be in the middle of it and making, making, being a part of making the changes. Um, and it's that simple. And I know it feels like at times it's heavy lift. It's, you're not getting heard, but I can tell you having done this for, I guess it's been 15 years. It, it does make a difference. It's just not as fast as any of us want it to be, yeah. <laughs> but I can tell you when we're not at the table, it goes very badly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes it goes much absolutely. worse absolutely well mike it's always nice chatting with you i'm glad you, we, you, you got time to do this for us no this is fun yeah and uh, hopefully you'll be at nc this this year i hope yeah well it's right in dc yes how could i, how could I not it's like it's <laughs> well, I down know. the road <laughs> <laughs> maybe you're like uh. <laughs> well, i'll definitely be there
So hopefully we'll get to catch up with you there. Absolutely. Absolutely, guys. Well, thank you for your time. This has been very entertaining. <laughs> I had a good time too. Thanks a lot for inviting All me. All right. Thank you for listening. This has been a production of the Pediatric Lounge. On the show notes, you will find links to our co-host and other important notes as well as a timetable of the topics discussed today. Don't forget to follow us on social media and subscribe to wherever you listen to your podcast. Leave us a great review as it helps us greatly. In the meantime, we will see you next week. The Pediatric Lounge. The conversations are not intended as medical advice and the opinions expressed are solely those of the host and the guests.